So Katie, anything going on in the world of crypto over the last week? There's a life altering event in the world of crypto this past week. You're talking about FTX's bankruptcy. I am. It's huge. It is huge. Well, we've got Bloomberg TV for all the breaking news, but we want to talk about crime and it's not necessarily crime associated with the downfall of FTX. Mm -hmm. Innocent until proven guilty. It is being investigated. But a different type of crime when it comes to crypto, specifically, Bitcoin and crime, and whether or not Bitcoin is actually good for crime. And whether it needs to be if we're thinking about money laundering. Bitcoin has been closely associated with crime since pretty much the beginning. In the early days, it was the currency of choice on the dark web, used in drug deals and even a murder for hire plot. In more recent years, it's been what hackers have demanded when they've held pipelines, hospital systems, and meatpacking plants hostage. And then there've been the hacks. October 2022 is on track to see more crypto stolen in hacks than any other month this year. And 2022 is on pace to be a record, according to Chainalysis. But is Bitcoin actually good for crime? Since all transactions are public on the blockchain, everyone can see Bitcoin move on the blockchain and governments and other organizations are getting better at recovering stolen Bitcoin. Plus, it's not actually that easy to launder Bitcoin, to turn lots of it into real usable money. This raises an important question. If Bitcoin isn't good at crime, then how can it live up to its promise as a stateless currency that could allow people in oppressed areas to transact with one another without a regulator seeing what they're up to? Joe Weisenthal of the Odd Lots podcast. We're not going to get into the FTX collapse, but you wrote back in February yeah. that it's time for Bitcoin and crypto in general to get better at crime. And we're talking about a different type of crime that FTX is being investigated for potentially more along the lines of money laundering. So lay out your case for us. Well, you know, like one of the core arguments that like Bitcoiners make is that it's like separation of uh, money and state, right? And that it's a sort of form of money that doesn't rely on the government. It doesn't rely on traditional banking system, et cetera. And when I wrote the piece, it was, if you recall, it was like during the Canadian trucking protest and there was yeah. that big convoy. And setting aside what, the, what one's view of the protests were, which I think is like kind of irrelevant to the question. The point is, if there's going to be a moment where people needed a form of money that could like they could transact without censorship, that was it. And it didn't really work for that. They were able to like very easily track the transactions. They were able to like freeze uh, wallets from like interacting with banks. So it's like, if Bitcoin is going to live up to its promise of being a, a means of transaction that is separate from the state, separate from the financial institutions, I don't think it's there yet in terms of whether it's privacy or obfuscation or uh, things like that. So you're essentially saying that if Bitcoin is to live up to its yeah. promise of being this stateless currency, yeah. something that could help an oppressed people, yeah. then it actually needs to be something that would also be good for criminals. I think that, yeah, that would be the implication. Because again, like what's, what's a criminal in one country or one city could just be a protester somewhere else. So to some extent, like it, this distinction is gonna be very like vague. Well, like, yeah, some places like protest is crime. Some place uh, free speech is crime. And so the point is that for it to like, yeah, fulfill its mission, then on some level there has to be a way to transact with it without the state being able to say, you got these coins and now these coins, if they ever go to an exchange, if they ever go to like a fiat off ramp, they'll be frozen. What is the point then? I think part of the reason I've been thinking about this column that you wrote for, I don't know, eight, nine months, yeah. is that it kind of made me think that crime is really subjective. Yeah. Like crime to one person, to one government, is not a crime to another government. Yeah, right. Like there are all there are there are certain categories of crimes that everyone would find to be like absolutely horrific. We shouldn't kill people. Absolutely, but there are other 
yeah, in different situations, like, you know, sending someone or selling a copy of the Bible might be a crime in some countries or a different religious text or any other sort of like protest or whatever it is. And so, yeah, that's exactly right. Like, how would you even begin to conceive of a currency that would work for what we would call like legitimate crime or legitimate dissonance within a country if it didn't work for things that we would consider to be reprehensible? But it works to a certain extent. And that's what it seems like, at least, because we are seeing still ransomware attacks that yeah. are, you know, yeah. essentially say, pay us X Bitcoin yeah. or else. Yeah, although even even ransomware attacks, there's a pretty big loss of market share by Bitcoin that we've seen to like some of the privacy coins. Like I think like if you look around like Monero, which is a much smaller, less liquid, less market cap coin is still popular among ransomware attacks in part because of this reason. It's like has privacy built into it from like wait, the ground up. Wait, so if you're a criminal and you want to do some crime, which is the right I would never use. suggest, but I do think that it speaks to, again, like, Ransomware is really bad. Mm -hmm. So this is not about that. The point is, is like, well, then if if it doesn't work for these, then what are like the sort of like freedom, sort of like outside the state, outside the financial institutions uh, use cases that it does work for? Because the point that I see is like, okay, they say it's like no one can block a Bitcoin transaction. No one can censor it. But isn't it a de facto form of censorship if an entity can say, these wallets can no longer move to an exchange. And I think that's an important sort of yeah. setup there that you can do yes. the hack and get Bitcoin in exchange. Yes. It's just, you can't really do anything with the Bitcoin that you Right, get. and you know, there's all kind of, like chain analysis is getting better and better. So it gets, it becomes easier to like connect an individual to a wallet and so forth. And like law enforcement, and private software companies are getting like really good at this. Mm -hmm. But if there's a point where it's like really hard to disassociate a coin from a human name, from someone that is known to officials, then you start to, I think, lose some of the promise of the currency. It's yeah. the point of anything, really. Well, that's, that's yeah. it. It's a whole different episode. The Philosophy Show. Joe Weisenthal, this was a delight. Thank you for having me, I'd love to be back. Beth Bisbee from Chainalysis, Sujit Raman from TRM Labs. It's good to have you both here with us. How are you? Great. Thanks for having us. What do you think of the crime scene? It's great. Very realistic. You know? yeah. is, this what it's like? is this what it's like when you investigate a crypto crime? Yeah. In the digital world, this is exactly what it's like. With you all know, the coins. All the coins, yeah. the, the yellow you know, crime yeah. scene. We're going for something that's really authentic. So that's some good feedback. Um, hey, Beth, I want to start with you. Uh, just. Give us an idea of the most shocking crime you've ever seen committed with crypto. So if I go back to my days when I was with the Drug Enforcement Administration, um, it was with drug traffickers and anywhere from um, drug trafficking with uh, money laundering using crypto for drug cartels or your run of the mill individuals that were down in their grandparents' basement mm. um, selling drugs on the internet. So those are shocking and the, the, of the um, in of, of themselves and like how the individuals actually like benefited from it and leveraging crypto for that. When I think about drugs and I think about Bitcoin and I think about them both together, I think about Silk Road. Like, is that the sort of stuff that we're talking about? Yeah, so kind of both, right? So the very first uh, really play of uh, drugs and crypto is Silk Road, right? Mm -hmm. That was one of the most innovative spaces for somebody to be like, how do I get this onto the black market? without being detected by law enforcement. And then this was a generation of leveraging Tor and the digital realm of what payment system was, which was crypto. And that's what created Silk Road. So for the traditional sense of the digital aspect for drug trafficking, yes, that would be what it is. However, um, anytime you have a type of crime, you can leverage crypto for that. So drug trafficking in the traditional sense where you have the actual bulk movement of large kilos of uh, drugs, um, individuals can still accept payment with that through crypto. Sujit, so same question. Mm -hmm. Most shocking crime using Bitcoin. They weren't necessarily shocking to me because criminals often go where the sort of technology is. But the first time I was really struck by how interesting crypto really could be was when I read the indictments charging those Russian intelligence officers with interfering in the elections in 2016. Because mm -hmm. if you read those indictments, you'll see that intelligence officers were using crypto to buy servers within the United States to try to sort of 
you know, obscure their tracks and use that to, to basically purchase the infrastructure that they then used to launch the hacks into the, the DNC emails and all that. And they even hosted the website that, you know, sort of hosted all that information through the payment of crypto. So when I was in a senior role at the Justice Department, that's the first time I realized, wow, I mean, crime is very important and all the stuff we're doing on sort of dark web is really important, but there's a foreign intelligence component to this. There's a, you know, defending democracy component to this. But ultimately those individuals were indicted. They were indicted and, and the allegations are in the indictment, right? And in the, in the indictment, you see the evidence of them using, what, was it Bitcoin? Correct, uh, various types of crypto. So the question, well, we'll keep the question to Bitcoin for now and then take it out to other types of crypto. But does it does that mean that it is or is not an effective uh, means to essentially commit crime with? So it, it, you know, it can be traced, right? And this is something that criminals often don't realize is that the Bitcoin network itself is, is quite traceable. And folks like my team at TRM Labs, Beth's team at Chainalysis have become very good at tracing those payments. So is it just dumb criminals at this point then? Because I feel like at least, I don't know, maybe I spend too much time in my own bubble, but I feel like it's pretty well known that you can track things on the blockchain by now. Well, I think a lot of people maybe don't realize that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is it still takes time, right? Mm -hmm. um, you've got technology like mixers and other types of technology that will help you sort of you know, mix up the transactions a little bit. Um, even that capability is something law enforcement can see through using the right and the effective tools. But there's a lot of crime out there and there's limited resources for law enforcement. Okay, so we talked about shock. Let's talk about scale. Because when I think about Silk Road, uh, that was a long time ago. Where does the state of crime using crypto stand right now? So if you look past like Silk Road, that was one marketplace. Once Silk Road was taken down, it kind of like did this whack-a-mole type of thing where it dispersed and criminals were like, oh, that's a really ingenious idea in order for me to actually do my criminal activities. So you see this uh, mold that then is being expanded within that. But if you go past just like darkened markets and drug trafficking or even um, the aspects of uh, child exploitation sites that are also being leveraged on that, um, the other type of crime is not necessarily financially driven. So we've seen individuals that have taken advantage of the Bitcoin blockchain and um, have been able to put messaging within the transactions so that it's encrypted and the, there's botnets that then crawl the block, blockchain in order to decrypt that to then infiltrate different aspects. So what we saw with this was a bunch of crypto jacking that was actually occurring. So rather than just seeing the transaction that was occurring on a financial aspect, this is now being deployed for a cyber component as well. I mean, something we noticed just the, you know, a few weeks ago is ISIS is trying to raise funds through the use of NFTs. Mm -hmm. Completely novel application of the technology. The technology is amazing, it's great, but illicit actors can also use it in novel ways that are actually pretty concerning. How are they trying to do that? So basically, you know, you create sort of an NFT and use that as a means of collecting funds. And so our team at TRM was able to identify that in advance and essentially notify, you know, law enforcement and it's since been taken down. It doesn't look like, uh, you know, they had actually mobilized the NFT yet. They were basically doing the preparatory work. I assume those NFTs weren't like pudgy penguins or anything like that. <laughs> I um, wish. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you, you bring up actually my next question, which is like, I actually just don't get how ISIS would do this with an NFT. Like I explain how this would work. Well, essentially you would, you know, send funds to that NFT, right? You would use that digital representation to store value. And, and I mean- to So that point, NFT would be not associated officially with a terrorist organization. Co correct. You wouldn't realize that at the time that you were sending it, though people in the know would know to send and it would evade detection, right? So you're people essentially would... setting up a bank account that is unlinked to any entity in order to raise funds for terrorists. Right, essentially you would be receiving funds in a digital manner that's not tied to any particular KYC information, right? Know your customer. Know your customer, and you would then use that and sort of move it off, you know, move it to other chains or other areas and then try to turn it into cash. So to that point, I feel like ISIS wouldn't have been using NFTs, I don't know, three, four years ago. I know you both have been involved in the space for a long time. Uh, Beth, I know that you've been looking at, you know, illicit activities using crypto since 2014. We've touched on some of this, but tell me how the use case has evolved since then. Has it gotten more creative? How has it changed? Oh, it's definitely more creative. So I like to always think back, like back in the good old days with Bitcoin, because <laughs> it's no longer the good old days. 
where like the technology has advanced and all of these um, different aspects of cryptocurrency have popped up. So you have NFTs, you now have all of the DeFi tokens that are available and the platforms that are operating in that manner that it's hard to keep up with all of that. So not only are you having individuals that are still in the Bitcoin realm, but they're now transitioning into the DeFi space. Mm -hmm. And um, there's so many advancements with that, with blockchains on top of other blockchains, and um, just being able to understand what that technology represents, as well as how criminals are using that technology for what it does not necessarily represent, right? And I, I, to me, that's the evolution that will always continue. Um, and being able to um, understand how it's being leveraged is one of the most um, interesting things for the evolution of what cryptocurrency is. Is it kind of easy to make money as a criminal using crypto? I would say there are uh, ways to take advantage of the systems for sure. So you have platforms now where you can stake funds, right? And you can stake that with criminal funds. Mm -hmm. And so like you actually are earning money and interest on all of these different things that are actually illicitly earned. I'm, I'm wondering if what you heard from Joe Weisenthal mm -hmm. makes sense that this stuff in order for it to actually serve its promise as a stateless currency and help people who are oppressed, it has to become better at crime. Because what you guys do at TRM, at Chainalysis, like you track this stuff, something that we know can be tracked now, but people had this idea that it was untrackable. Well, look, I think privacy is very important, right? And so, you know, at, at TRM, for example, we don't touch personal sensitive data. It's all the blockchain information is publicly available. It's on a public blockchain and you can trace it over time. Which is what Joe was saying is why it's not good for crime. Right. But, you know, just because something isn't necessarily good for crime doesn't mean that it's it's a it's a bad thing, right? There's a lot of positive use cases for for crypto generally or for distributed ledger technology, which is what all of the stuff is based on that, you know, often people are are overlooking, right? I mean, think about, you know, the last time you tried to send funds to if you've got relatives in other parts of the world. You know, in the traditional banking system, it takes days, there's fees everywhere, and it takes forever. It costs right? a lot of money. And it costs a lot of money. Yeah. And with crypto, and you need a bank account on both sides. If you were a criminal, would you use crypto or would you put the cash in a suitcase and sort of try to shovel around that way? So can I give you my honest answer? Yes. Please. I am not a criminal. Yeah, sure. Okay, that's on this, the record. This is a brain exercise though. It requires yeah. us to suspend reality. I mean, look, cash is still king when it comes to illicit activity, right? Crypto is certainly a means of doing illegal things but there are aspects that are more traceable, but there are aspects that make it more obfuscatable, like mixers and other mm. kinds of technology. So I, you know, I certainly wouldn't be in the business of advising criminals what to do or what not to do. Beth, you just talked a lot about state actors, and I'm wondering in, in your work, if you have any data that shows to what extent the crime is being connect, con, committed by state-sponsored actors versus by rogue individuals with no connection to a state. Yeah, so what we were able to identify is that um, for nation state actors, there's over $400 million that we have been able to tie to um, North Korea, for instance, right? However, if you look at just individual illicit actors within that, um, although the hacks are very large, so $600 million at a time for a hack, right? It makes and grabs attention for headlines. However, what is not being um, looked at are individuals that are still soliciting um, illicit means, but they're doing it at a, large, a smaller scale, but a higher transaction rate. So that actually supersedes the amount that's actually being moved mm -hmm. on uh, the illicit scale for that. That's really interesting. And I swear, I'm just curious. So if you were committing a crime, it sounds like just a series of smaller transactions makes a lot more sense. In any type of uh, movement for financial means, that, that is the best way, right? So um, being so in a traditional uh, financial aspect, right, there's reporting requirements in order to for transactions that hit a banking system, right? And so um, and those are the suspicious activity reports that financial institutions and money service businesses are actually supposed to report. So if you're underneath that threshold, like you're not going to be able to um, be reported on what is as that easily. Threshold? Uh, Ten thousand dollars for um, funds that are going. You're asking yeah. a lot of weird <laughs> questions. I want specifics. Man. You know, in all seriousness, um, all this talk of state actors kind of has me thinking about whether or not all of this is actually a good development or not. And I'm wondering. You know, North Korea recently launched a missile over Japan and sent 
you know, shockwaves throughout the world. And they do this every once in a while. And I'm wondering, Sujit, if you think North Korea would be as powerful as it is today and as much of a menace to the rest of the world if there was no such thing as crypto. Yeah, I, I think you can strip the crypto conversation out of that because North Korea has been engaging in this kind of malign cyber activity for years. They tried to steal, I think it was a billion dollars from the Bank of Bangladesh a few years ago, but basically hacking into the Federal Reserve of New York's account that the Bank of Bangladesh was using and siphon that money out. Nothing to do with crypto, right? It was just a cyber hack. So crypto certainly makes it you know, a more interesting conversation because there are certain things that nation state actors can do that they couldn't do more you know, as easily in a, in a purely kind of analog world. Do you guys like crypto? I mean, do you see you guys look at the worst side of crypto when you zoom out from that? I mean, do you see this as a net positive or what are your feelings? All right, it's definitely a net positive. Like it's innovation at its finest and it's really fascinating to be able to watch um, being able to step back and see that individuals that maybe in underprivileged areas that have access to financial means through crypto is fantastic. And just being able to leverage that in a way that makes it to where almost everybody can be on the same uh, playing field, to me, is one of the most rewarding things within this space. Would you agree with Sujit that we have to strip crypto out of the conversation there because even if there were no crypto, these sanctioned countries would still be able to access funds to, to fund whatever they're doing. Yeah, and like I would actually say that the crypto aspect is actually a positive thing with it. And I say that because it is transparent for us to be able to actually track those funds and actually see what is going on within those different um, countries, which is if you took the crypto out of it like completely, we would lose insight into what's actually going on and we wouldn't be able to tie that back to us. Does it, Sujit, undermine American foreign policy at all? So look, that's a really interesting question. Um, obviously, certain countries are trying to use crypto to kind of evade the international you know, global financial system, which is very much US led, or at least led by kind of Western countries and Western values. But here's an interesting kind of other side to it. You, you talk about stable coins, right? Which are basically tied to the US dollar. I could see a world in which if there is more expansion of stable coins, that actually promotes the growth of the US dollar into areas where it maybe doesn't exist now. So, you know, crypto, again, cuts both ways. You've got to really understand it, and then you can make good policy. Who's your favorite TV cop? Like, who do you model <laughs> yourself after? Well, I, uh, I was not a cop, I was a prosecutor. So if you watch Law & Order, yes. I always identified with the lawyers, but I did like the guys in Law & Order. Got to be honest. I wish SVU, I knew their names. SVU, like SVU, regular... yeah, it's uh, Mariska Hargitay's character. I like a lot. Olivia Benson. There it is. Yeah. Beth, what about you? So mine, it's not a TV show, but it would be Clarice from uh, Silence of the Lambs. Oh, yes. that's a yes. good one. So, Do you identify with her? Yeah. So my whole dream job, right, was to actually be a profiler, and that's what I wanted to do. And then I got sidetracked with crypto, so here I am. <laughs> Sujit Raman, Beth Bisbee, good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. It kind of seems like you're ready for a life of crime. I don't know. After listening to this episode, we mapped a pretty good blueprint. But not using Bitcoin. Maybe Monero, definitely a mixer, and I would keep it under 10 grand. I thought you were a grizzled old cop with a heart of gold. Things change.